So I am Sara Giovannini. Uh, I work for the Network Energy Cities, um, and I'm also uh, coordinating the Energy Cities uh, Community Energy Hub. Uh, Energy Cities has different uh, um, hubs, like our community spaces, that are mainly uh, uh, to activate, empower, and inspire our member, but also, uh, in general, local leaders uh, towards a, cl a climate-neutral Europe. Uh, the webinar of today is organizing the framework of this uh, of this hub, community-led energy for massive renewable production. And you're uh, welcome to uh, we uh, register to the bulletin of this hub. We have a, a bulletin, and you can find more information on Energy City's website. And that's uh, uh, also where we share normally every news or every event that we are planning in the uh, in on this topic. Uh, today, I'm very happy to have uh, with us uh, three speakers. Um, Monica Moravieka uh, uh, from the Regulatory Assistant Project. She's senior advisor. And uh, uh, Frederic Hagebert uh, from the Energy Cooperative Bovin. And uh, Maria Flora Midebo Andersen from uh, 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 the company Real. And Thanks to these uh, uh, three speakers, uh, we will learn more about power purchase agreement for renewables and how can cities uh, make the most of it to uh, facilitate uh, renewable energy deployments on their territories. Uh, this is uh, the agenda of the webinar. Uh, Monica will start with a with her presentation where she will give us an introduction around uh, the, mm, the topic of PPAs. Then Frederic will follow uh, with the practical experience uh, uh, of Bovin with their PPAs with the city of Ghent in Belgium. And then Maria Flora will uh, conclude the presentation part of the webinar. Uh, she will uh, um, talk about rethinking electricity procurement in an innovative uh, way. And please be uh, aware that we will uh, uh, take questions. Um, you, you can uh, post in the chat your question uh, for the entire duration of the of the webinar, so even during the presentation. And uh, also uh, at the end of each presentation, we might take one question, but the other questions will be taken all um, after uh, all the presentation uh, taken place. Um, during the Q&A, you will be able also to uh, ask questions directly by raising your hand. My colleague uh, Ian will uh, monitor the chat and also uh, uh, make sure that uh, your, your questions don't go unanswered. Uh, I'd like to give the floor directly now to Monica Moravieka from uh, Regulatory Assistance Project for her presentation introduction on PPAs. Thank you, Monica. You have the floor. Thank you, Sarah, uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, let me just share my screen. Do you let me know when you see it? We can see you. Okay, wonderful. Right, so without uh, much uh, more ado, uh, let me just give you a brief, very brief and high level overview of what renewable PPAs are, why we would want to sign them, and how to think about them in practical ways, and what things to consider when um, signing them or considering to sign them. So let's just go, okay, if my screen works, doesn't now. Mm, yeah. All right, so what is a renewable PPA? Um, that, that is really very simple answer to that question. And there are three things. Uh, here that I wanted to talk about. Renewable PPA, so PPA, the acronym stands for Power Purchase Agreement, which is to say a contract to purchase electricity, basically. Very simple. Now, renewable PPA tells you that it is directly from a renewable producer. And also the third thing I want to talk about here is it's typically long-term, long-term meaning five to 15, maybe even 20 years. So these three things, it's an electricity purchase agreement with a renewable producer and typically long-term. This is what we understand by the term renewable PPA. Now, just going really briefly to 
why would you sign one? So first of all, let's consider one side of this equation, which is the renewable producer. What benefits the renewable producers have? Well, it's also quite simple. Um, a renewable PPA gives you basically a long-term offtake agreement for your electricity production, meaning secured to an extent revenues. Now, secured revenues, of course, mean easier on, or in many ways cheaper financing or even access to financing in the first place, which means then an investment decision can be taken. So that's in brief, a renewable PPA benefit for an investor willing to invest in a renewable source. Now, looking at the other side of the PPA, and here let's focus on municipalities or cities that we're talking here about. So there are many benefits here. I would only touch upon like four main ones or three main ones and one particular for one type of PPA. Of course, first of all, it can be cheaper. A PPA procurement uh, of electricity can be cheaper, but doesn't have to be. We'll maybe talk about that uh, in a minute, but especially in a crisis situation that we had, PPAs and renewable electricity will be cheaper than um, the one from the grid. But maybe even more importantly, it gives you a long-term visibility of electricity price. So it gives you the stability of electricity price. And of course, what is probably most important for people in this room, really interested in sustainability, decarbonization, um, net zero agenda, it, it's contributing to your sustainability goals. And last but not least, if a PPA is signed with a generator local to the re area or you are in by signing PPA, um, you're incentivizing new build of renewable electricity in your area. That's also contributing to local economy, local jobs and so forth. So there are clear benefits for both sides, for the side of investors and municipalities or other off takers because obviously renewable PPAs predominantly right now in Europe are signed by corporates, by big corporations and industrial um, industrial companies. All right, so now we want what is a PPA in general terms? Why would you like to sign one? And then let's consider some of the practicalities. What options do you have when thinking about PPA it is really a broad term, and there are many, many different types of PPAs that you can think of. I will just list the three basic ones here and then focus a bit more on, on the two. So first option, a really basic option is a sort of, um, let's say, let's call it a direct line PPA, which is to say on your ground, on your premises, a renewable installation is built and there is a direct sort of wire from, from this installation to your uh, to your premises and you sign a contract to buy this electricity directly from the renewable producer. It is a very simple, um, but also very not that often um, used PPA because it's not that often that you really have space for a renewable installation at your premises. Of course, with the exception of roofs, rooftop PV is definitely one that, that could be used for that. Um, an explanation of the, of the graphics here, you will have each time a green arrow means electricity flows and a red arrow means money flows basically. And you've got here uh, this acronym GOOs, which is guarantees of origin, which is the sort of a paper that certifies that this electricity is indeed from a renewable source. Um, so that's the, the first basic option. But the second option and one that is much more widely used is a so-called physical or sleeved PPA, which essentially is an electricity supply contract. So you basically have to have an intermediary between you and between the renewable producer and uh, the off-taker. And this intermediary takes care, if you will, of your whole supply. And through this intermediary flows both electricity and money flows. And I won't 
go into much details. This is in reality a bit more complicated than this picture shows. But one thing to, to maybe remember is that the, this is a electricity supply contract. So it's physically uh, buying this electricity, renewable electricity that flows through the grid. It's not physical on your premises, but it's a supply contract. And of course, there are many variations here because you can you can have as produced supply contract, meaning that whenever this solar farm or wind farm is producing, you are buying this electricity. But when it's not producing, you have to buy from somebody else, from your supplier, from your normal supplier. Or it can be a baseload contract, which means that this firming, if you will, or this balancing of the renewable electricity is done by the uh, by the producer or by the balancing responsible party. Let's not go maybe into much detail in this, but basically a green electricity supply contract, which is a physical PPA. And then the last type of the major types that I will talk to you about, and it's probably the most complicated here on this picture as well, is a virtual PPA. A virtual PPA is a really a financial contract. So there is no delivery of electricity of any kind really in this contract but it is a contract between the renewable producer and the off taker in the sense that they do agree on the price for a specific amount of electricity produced by this uh, energy renewable energy producer but it is a difference contract so a contract for difference just like the other contracts for difference that are auctioned by the governments in the sense that let me explain it in a very simple terms. The renewable producer would normally send sell the electricity on whatever platform was power exchange or some other platform and will receive money for it. Then the second party, which is the off taker, municipality or corporate, will buy electricity at wherever they buy electricity from from their suppliers. And then the contract stipulates that whenever the price that is, whenever the price, the market price deviates from the pre-agreed price, there is a difference payment from either the renewable producer to the off-taker or back. So here you see the two arrows. So the money flows could be from renewable producer to the off-taker or the reverse. So the, this is a financial virtual PPA. It's probably the most complicated, but on the other hand, it's quite widely used, and we will uh, probably hear a, a bit more about that in the in later in in our webinar today. So, for the of these three options, the two will be probably you'll hear uh, much more about them um, in the next presentations. So I'll, I won't uh, spend too much time on that now. Now, of course, there are many, many things to consider when considering signing PPA. So I will just list a few, but there, it's still quite a lot. So, of course, you have to consider what renewable source type you want to sign with, whether wind, solar or a mix, maybe. Uh, then investor type could be of interest, whether you don't care really who's the investor or maybe you want to prefer a cooperative or energy community. Uh, procurement type. Do you do a, an auction for a contract? Do you do, for example, concession um, auction for concession on, for city roofs? That's also a possibility. Uh, do you supply for all your own needs only? Or maybe do you want to do energy sharing with your citizens, with, uh, with, um, with people living in your city? Um, again, is it a base load or is it a paper, as produced uh, con type of contract? Uh, now, the balancing costs you have to consider in the additional supply if you're only taking the production of the real energy source. The pricing is important, of course. Then uh, contract duration, we talked about it. It's usually between five to 15 years, which has both advantages and disadvantages for both sides, actually. Um, Geographical um, correlation, do you want it to, to be as close as possible or you don't care wherever in your country or even abroad? Um, additionality, that's a word that we will probably talk about a bit later, so I won't spend uh, too much time, but it's basically saying 
I want to sign a PPA with a renewable investment investment that will happen because of my PPA. So not with an existing plan, which is, of course, possible as well. And people do sign PPAs with existing installations. But this is where your sustainability goals come into play. If you want to really contribute to more renewable production, then this is the, the sort of the key word to use for that addition, additionality. Then, of course, physical or virtual. We talked about that um, a minute ago. And we will talk about 24-7 um, PPAs, which is to say that I'm really supplying, physically supplying my electricity needs with 24-7 uh, green electricity, so all the time, which is a very difficult time, uh, difficult thing to do now. So these are some of the issues to be uh, to be considered. And once you look at these issues, it's quite apparent that there are many challenges um, when thinking about signing a, a PPA, renewable PPA. Some of these challenges are complexity. It's really complex. These documents, the, the PPAs are really complex instruments, whatever, whether they're physical or virtual, really require lots of expertise, legal, energy trading, financial expertise. There is this credit risk um, to consider. So the producer, the renewable producer credit, credit worthiness, how do we manage that risk? There's also market risk. So you can now, of course, you see renewable PPAs might be beneficial from the cost perspective, but not always, maybe. Um, so you have to ask yourself then whether you do have adequate competencies that are able to deal with all these challenges and these questions. Um, and there are also some specific challenges, I think, to municipalities, to cities, to public authorities, basically. Do you have any public financing restrictions on signing those long-term contracts? Does public procurement law pose a challenge? And what challenge is that? How to, how to overcome this? Your own credit worthiness, or uh, as the customer, as the as the off taker side, and how to um, how to be a credit worthy partner for the renewable um, producer when they can also sign a PPA with a big corporation. And for some of these challenges, of course, there are there may be um, good answers, and there are uh, there is a big role for governments and for regulators really in that. First of all, of course, what will help immensely would be standardization of contracts. These PPAs are now really bespoke, each one negotiated painstakingly with between the parties, and there, there really is not too much standardization going on. Now, some legislative changes could be considered to alleviate some of the problems that are there. And of course, state guarantees for municipal PPAs could be a way forward and uh, they could actually happen based on a uh, European law. So these are some of the challenges that we see, some of the um, things to consider, but the thing to remember uh, is also that really there is no shortage of, of renewables going forward. You will see on this graph the green bars are the PPA volumes that were signed in Europe from 2018. To red bar, uh, the right-hand bars show you the build-out of renewables in the future, uh, annual build-outs that we achieved last year and that we will hopefully achieve by 2030. So there is no shortage of renewables. You will have a lot of willing investors to sign these contracts with you. And with that, I'll give it back to Sarah. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks a lot, Monica, for this great presentation. Um, I see that uh, uh, at the moment in the chat, there are no questions. So we'll uh, uh, proceed with the uh, next presentation. And of course, in the meantime, if you have questions, you can write them uh, or you can ask them at the end. So I give the floor to Frederic from the Energy Cooperative Bilbao. Frederic, you can share your screen. Okay. Thank you uh, both for the interesting introduction. Let me start with mine. Um, Monica described some challenges, um, which are uh, very true, um, but I'll 
bring you to uh, a case which we've developed uh, to show the nice opportunities that exist for cities and communities to enable um, energy renewable energy projects. Let me start by introducing uh, Bovon in uh, two minutes. Um, as mentioned by Sarah, we are a renewable energy community, a cooperative, which means that all our shareholders are uh, citizens. Uh, we've united more than 8,600 uh, shareholders uh, by now. Um, and to join our movement, our family, uh, it's sufficient to buy one share of 250 uh, euros. Everyone is free to, to join. And every time we realize a new project, um, we uh, organize a call for capital. So uh, people, either members, uh, employees of a certain company, citizens of a certain city, uh, are allowed to join um, our capital. Um, and in return for the 250 euro of a multiple of these 250 euros, uh, they will receive a yearly dividend of a certain amount, depending on the profit of the company at that time. We are uh, capped, so we are not allowed to share more than uh, 6% uh, of, of interest on our dividend. Um, and we've done that in the past 18 years. We've uh, distributed dividends between 325% and 6%. I will show you a solar uh, case uh, in Ghent, um, but we are doing more than just uh, solar installations. We've built more than 200 uh, solar installations in the past um, 18 years. Um, we've also realized five wind uh, turbines. We are also active in heating projects. We are managing one large district heating network in uh, the city of Ostend uh, in, in Belgium. And we have uh, six cogeneration uh, projects uh, realized mostly at industrial sites. In the past 23 years, we've gathered almost 18 million euros and we will have a turnover of 9 million euros. Um, that's quite a significant result. It's a quite a large operation in the meantime. Um, we've realized that with 13 uh, people in our team. That's Bovan, that's who we are. Um, what I was asked to, to present to you today, uh, we've had uh, some very interesting insight from Monica, uh, some more theoretical parts of what is the PPA, how does it work? Um, I would like to show to you this uh, real life case of a solar installation uh, in Ghent. Um, Ghent, the city of approximately 260,000 citizens uh, in, in Flanders, Belgium. The roof you are seeing here is uh, close to the port uh, of, uh, of Ghent. Uh, these were the rules before our project. Um, and they are the rules of a company called Le Mayer. You can see it um, described uh, in, in the rules. Um, and they are an importer and distributor of uh, timber. Um, and they have an operational plant in, in Austin uh, where they treat wood to make it more durable. Uh, but the uh, venue here in Ghent is mainly storage. It's, uh, it's warehouses uh, where all the wood is, is kept. Um, and we have, uh, we realized that in the beginning of this year, we've installed more than uh, 15,000 solar panels on these roofs. It's our largest uh, project uh, in the history of, of Beauvoir, and it produces approximately 7,000 megawatt of hours of electricity. To give you an idea, it's the equivalent of around uh, 2,000 2, households uh, using uh, electricity uh, a year. So it's quite a large installation. I think it's the third largest installation in Ghent and must be in the top 20 in, uh, in Belgium. To give you some ideas around the financials, uh, this installation can cost up to uh, 5 million euros and uh, 700,000 euros was financed uh, through a call for capital uh, with local citizens. 715 Ghent uh, citizens of Ghent were able to purchase shares and raised 700,000 euros. Another part of financing came from the Lumio uh, group uh, themselves. We've created a joint venture together with them to finance uh, this, uh, this project. That's a general overview of this project. 
Um, as mentioned, Lemayu Group is a timber company, um, and this is mainly warehouses, which means that there was no significant local consumption. Usually when you develop a solar project, what you do is put the solar panels on the roof, generate electricity, and the electricity is sold to um, the renter of, or the owner of the roof, which has installations uh, in the building. This was not the case here. Uh, as mentioned, it, this is mainly storage, which means that there is a, almost no consumption at all. And usually uh, in that case, um, you won't realize, as a developer, you won't realize a solar installation because you need a sufficient um, uh, consumption of electricity to have a clear business case. Um, so how do, did we manage to, 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 um, to break that catch-22 situation, let's say? It's because we signed a virtual PPA uh, with the city of Ghent. As mentioned uh, by, uh, by Monica, a virtual PPA means that electricity is not sold directly from our roof, from our installation to the city. It goes through other electricity uh, suppliers, but we have a long-term a price agreement and long term uh, means 15 years. So for 15 years, we agreed with the city of Ghent to have a fixed price for the electricity which is uh, generated on these roofs. Uh, together uh, with the electricity, there are also the guarantees of origins, and these guarantees of origins are transferred to the city uh, of Ghent for their uh, electricity consumption. What I like to mention, and which is also very interesting, um, by establishing this virtual PPA, uh, there were still, or there are, and there, uh, there were still some uh, subsidy schemes available in Flanders, but uh, due to the guarantees we had with the city of Ghent, we could realize this installation without any additional subsidies. So it, I think that's the most, or as a city or as a community, by just um, enabling and by reassuring developers through a long-term price uh, engagement, it's possible to realize this uh, kind of large solar installations without any additional subsidy. Um, Monica already showed some benefits, and so this is uh, something I can can confirm. Due to the fact that for 15 years we had the guarantee that we had uh, sufficient income uh, to uh, pay back our investment, we could realize this installation. If we didn't have this, uh, this guarantee, we were, uh, let's say, uh, open to the market and open to the risks of the market. Uh, we wouldn't have realized this project. With the necessary guarantees obtained by the city of Kent, we could uh, realize this project realize this very large project and contribute to the energy transition, which is our uh, mission as an uh, energy cooperative. And additionally, uh, that was one of the criteria to, uh, to realize this project. We could also engage 750 local citizens in this project. That's from our perspective, our benefits for, uh, regarding this, uh, this collaboration and this virtual PPA. What are the benefits for the city of Ghent? Of course, due to that uh, fixed price uh, for 15 years, they have hedged some part, and it's not 100% of their electricity consumption, but they have approximately 30 to 40% of their electricity consumption is hedged um, with a fixed price. That's a major advantage and one big advantage. Secondly, is that Ghent has very ambitious um, energy, renewable energy objectives due to this collaboration uh, with Beauvau. Uh, they were able to realize on the premises of the city of Ghent, or in the city of Ghent, to realize a large project uh, that generates 7,000 megawatt hours in green electricity. And they have access to these guarantees of origin. And then last but not least, um, as we are an energy cooperative, Profits realized uh, with or through our company, through our cooperative, are shared with our shareholders. So these 750 uh, people that purchased shares of Beauvau will, in the coming years, as long as they stay remain member or shareholder, will receive profits 
from this solar installation. So that's a lot of words and a lot of um, a, lot, a lot of slides. Um, let me just take you to a one minute video of the result of this uh, this installation. I'll share my screen again with sound because there is some sound. Here we are. So that was a quick video. Um, some other video starting up. Okay. Um, I hope that we have had a short term, a short term time to to elaborate on this matter. If you want to know more about the project, just ping uh, with me, send an email, or connect with me on, on LinkedIn, and you can ask some questions as well uh, via the chat or maybe after the presentation. I hope it was clear, and I encourage you to set up a same. A uh, system of working with um, local energy uh, producers um, through your cities and communities. Good luck. Thanks a lot, Frederic. And for information, uh, you will uh, receive uh, the presentations also uh, with, together with the link to the recording after in the, in the following days. Um, in the presentation, you will also see the, the contacts of, the, of Frederic in this case. Uh, I'm giving the floor now to Maria Flora from Real. Uh, Maria Flora, you can share your screen. Thank you very much. I will do that. And can you can you not, Sarah, if you see my screen now? Perfect. So I am with the company Real, and just like Frederick, I will give a very brief intro to what we do. We are a B2B electricity provider, and, and when it's B2B, it just means that we don't cater to individual electricity consumers, but we can service both companies and public authorities and institutions alike. We are founded in climate science, and that is quite literally as we are a spin out from the Technical University of Denmark based on thorough research of the environmental impact of electricity systems. We believe in a world running 100% on renewable energy, and we believe that we need to transform corporate and institutional electricity procurement in order to accelerate the renewable energy transition because when you look at who actually consumes the largest amount of energy, this can be ascribed in particular to corporates and public institutions, including cities and hospitals. So just very basically, the need for electricity will increase. These are European numbers. So as you can see, we need in order to achieve the renewable transition, to make sure that we contribute in any way we can to expanding the renewable capacity. And there are 
of course, more than one ways that you can do that. Here we have created like a small letter to illustrate some of the different measures that can be taken. So one thing that some corporates and, and even some cities do is that they purchase guarantees of origin. So this is a, an instrument, a purely market-based instrument that in and of itself has no proven effect. If it is bundled with a power purchase agreement, like was the case of what uh, Frederic, for instance, was uh, talking about with the case of Ghent, then this is merely a token that can demonstrate the actual effect. So, so this is the concept of additionality that Monica was also referring a bit to and that, that Frederic uh, illustrated very well with the PPA that they have done with the city of Ghent. So we always advise all customers, regardless of whether they are corporates or whether they are public authorities, to be very mindful of whether additionality is important for you to achieve or not. So if it is important for you to achieve additionality, namely that you can point directly to new renewable energy being built as a consequence of your agreement to purchase it, then you should look towards PBA-based electricity procurement, like illustrated by Frederick, or own on-site renewable energy production from that could be typically solar PV or wind turbines. So these are both two ways to ensure additionality. Then there, I will briefly touch upon a procurement regime known as the 24-7 carbon-free energy. This is a global movement of some of the most ambitious energy buyers worldwide. It is spearheaded by the United Nations Energy Compact, and it has been adopted by a wide variety of actors, most prominently can be mentioned Google and Amazon. So what is behind the 24-7 carbon-free energy philosophy is to make sure that we meet every single kilowatt hour that we use with carbon-free sources. So what does this mean? I will I will illustrate this very briefly with, with also a, a graph. But basically, this means that we strive to achieve simultaneity between electricity production and electricity consumption. So we basically want production and consumption to happen at the same time to the largest extent possible. Then we also want to strive for geographical proximity. So we basically want to make sure that the electricity that is generated as a result of our electricity agreement is done so in the same zone as where we buy the electricity and use the electricity. So for instance, a lot of our customers are based in Denmark, so they could theoretically make a power purchase agreement for a PPA asset in Spain. This, this can actually be an additional contract, but we would not have achieved the geographical proximity because the electricity is produced to a different grid from where it is actually consumed. Then there's the concept of additionality, which is also one of the principles behind 24-7 carbon-free energy. And then we have this approximation of hourly matching and providing and planning for demand side flexibility. And this I will go a bit more into detail with after introducing multi-buyer PPAs. So just to briefly recap a power purchase agreement, it's a contract between an energy buyer, which could be a city and an energy developer, who could be a, a solar PV developer or a wind turbine developer to purchase electricity long term. At real, we do contracts from five years as the shortest and up towards 10 years as the longest. And then as you can see here illustrated by Denmark, we divide this into the two bidding zones. So in Denmark, electricity is traded in the western part of Denmark and in the eastern part of Denmark separately. So we will always match companies with assets that are located within the same bidding zone. For many companies and cities, it doesn't make necessarily make sense to make one PPA only for your entire electricity consumption for one asset. And, and this is essentially to manage risk in the best possible way that you can divide your electricity consumption on different 
assets and therefore also on different PPAs. So you always have one PPA corresponding to one asset. And the reason why we do that is twofold. So one is that you always make a specific price for a PPA per kilowatt hour when you do it with real. This is typically how it is. And this is always a reflection of the current market outlook. So if you had made a PPA in December 2021, the price would have been much different than if you had done the same PPA in August 2022, because there had been significant changes in the electricity market, which made sure that everyone had different expectations for the future electricity prices. So when you negotiate PPA prices, this will of course always be done when taking into consideration what is the current market outlook. If you make a PPA that is divided towards more multiple assets and you do this at different points of time, so maybe you do PPA one, and then after six months, you do another chunk of your electricity consumption on PPA two and et cetera with a third PPA, then you can make sure that you actually diversify your price risk. So that is the one element. The second element is in terms of the profile risk. So when you make a pay as produced PPA, then you purchase the electricity according to when the wind blows and when the sun shines. And of course, we can't really control when the sun shines or when the wind blows. So what we do instead is that we make sure to tailor a very concrete PBA strategy to fit any given energy bias needs. So if we imagined this to be a city's energy consumption, then we would we have a proprietary tech platform where we can, with our AI, tailor a unique energy consumption profile, which we use to inform the PPA procurement strategy. So for instance, here we add a solar profile and then we subsequently will add a wind profile. So in this case, the optimal mix is 56% solar and 27% wind. So because we can't command the sun and the wind, we use the historical data about wind and solar to define what is the best way to procure electricity. As you can see here, there is a total match of 83% in this particular case. So this means that this city will have procured uh, 87 of their hours. They will be directly matched with a wind turbine or a solar asset that is producing energy within the same hour that they use it. And, and in this case, they are buying 92% of their total consumption. So that means there is also a, approximately, in this case, 9% that is produced during hours when the city doesn't need it. So that you can see here is the blue area on top of the the consumption graph and the yellow area on top of the uh, solar consumption graph here. And this will then be sold back to the grid. And in that sense, you can say you contribute with renewable electricity to the grid during those hours. Correspondingly, there will also be hours where you need to consume electricity, even though your PBA assets don't produce. There, in this case, we will always make sure to purchase electricity from the spot market. But this is used as a way to manage the profile risk, because if you very often, depending on your profile, if you only purchase electricity from a solar plant and you do it in a pay as produced consumption profile, then there will be a lot of hours where you are not covered by your PPA and then you will have to buy it from the spot market, which of course will expose you to spot market volatility. So this is basically our ways to tackle the intermittency of renewables and using it as a way to create an optimal procurement portfolio. Yeah, so, so concludingly, this is just to, to show more graphically, this was a, a proposal we had from a dialogue with the Danish municipality. Um, and, and then I have added uh, one 
on um, one solar asset that they would do first, and then they can use this as a way to get started, and then you would subsequently add a wind asset and a solar asset, and then you will continuously evaluate how your PBAs perform and also how your electricity consumption evolves over time, because this can, of course, either you can implement efficiency measures that make your consumption go down over time, or you can maybe electrify more of the public transport, which would cause it to go up. So in that way, when you when you do a, a more um, aggregate portfolio management, then you can stabilize yourself against these these uh, different movements in your electricity consumption. So this was a very concrete way of how you can think about your uh, your electricity procurement strategy and maybe even incorporate some of the elements from the 24-7 carbon-free energy procurement philosophy. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Maria Flora. It's very interesting what you just presented. Um, I think if it would be uh, now a, a good time to take questions. Um, if you have questions for Maria Flora specifically, maybe you can we can take that um, first because she will soon have to leave for another event. Um, so feel free either to raise your hand or to write the questions in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I see that there is already one. So. Um, we can start with that one since it's for all the speakers. Um, it's about uh, uh, PPAs for renewable eating. So the question is, PPAs are generally used for purchasing renewable electricity. I was wondering if the panel are aware of similar models uh, being used when it comes to renewable eating. Maybe industrial heat users who buy credits which represent investment in the renewable eating installations. Anyone wants to take this? Monica? I want to take this, but just to say that, no, I haven't uh, really, but it's a very good question. I just can say that maybe, you know, heating market and basically heating is more local. It's not that, you know, spread out as electricity. So it happens locally, the, the production and consumption. But that yeah. that is a very good question, interesting one. Yeah, maybe I'd, I'd like to add, uh, I would say, yeah, it somehow, somehow uh, exists uh, or it exists. It doesn't it have the name PPA, but you can relate it um, as Monica mentioned, you have the three types with the direct line and then uh, the sleeve PPA and then the virtual PPA. Now, the uh, the latter two won't be won't be possible because, uh, as mentioned, heat is mostly a local uh, uh, question and it doesn't transport uh, 200 kilometers away, let's say. Um, but of course, the, the, let's say the direct line principle will be will be possible. For instance, with our district heating network in, in Ostend, uh, we have our uh, network which runs through the street and then uh, delivers heat to industrial ins installations or either residential uh, households. And then, of course, you have some kind of uh, PPA, uh, but then it's not a power purchase agreement, then it's the heat um, agreement which is uh, which is signed. So it somewhat exists in a similar way, but not for the more virtual ones, let's say. But it might be, uh, you might imagine it uh, as well, um, but it, it hasn't been done, but it's, it's good to, to, to raise the question. In any case, they won't be PPAs, but HPAs, right? Heat purchase HP. agreements, not PPAs. Indeed. I mean, who knows? I mean, it would be good. Uh, it would definitely be good to see anything like this happening in the future. Um, I see Maria Flora also said that she's not aware of any PPAs for eating. I don't know uh, how many um, uh, people are working for um, local governments, um, but if you are, it would be uh, also interesting for us to know if if uh, your municipality would consider entering in, into a 10-year contract to procure renewable electricity. 
is it something that a municipality, your municipality would be uh, willing to do? You can also raise your hand if you want to answer in person. Gerda is saying yes. Uh, where are which where which uh, municipality do you work for, Gerda? Bruges. Okay. So Belgium. John works for Dublin municipalities. There is another question from John. In terms of 24-7 uh, PPAs, is it common uh, for a guarantee of origin to be timestamped to prove the power is being generated when the customer is consuming, or is this matching of production and demand purely theoretical based on historical data? Who wants to answer this question? Oh, I think re related to the 24 7, um, I think uh, Maria will be able to. Uh, Let's see if Maria Flora <laughs> is still there, but I'm afraid I, that she had to leave. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, she unfortunately but, she had another commitment, so she had to leave at 3 20. So we don't have her with us anymore. But of course, um, in if we and take a step back from 24-7 PPA, of course, for the PPA uh, we've signed with, with the City of Ghent and then the guarantees of origin that are generated from our production, they're not time-stamped, but of course uh, the, the GOs are related to uh, the kilowatt hours or the megawatt hours of electricity being produced. So it's not time-stamped, but of course there's for every one uh, megawatt hour, there's a GOO uh, generated. Um, but it's not time stamped. It's uh, yeah, I can check into as as measured. Uh, for for the twenty four seven PPAs, definitely they are time stamped. So, so that's the whole idea that they are not theoretical, but really practical matching happens like real uh, time uh, correlation is there. Okay, thank you, Monica. Thank you, Frederic. Uh, is there any other question? Uh, if there are none, I can also ask another question. Ah, yeah, I see that there is a new one. Two questions. Did ah, yes, two questions. One is uh, about Poland. In Poland, it's almost impossible to conclude an agreement for more than four years under public procurement law. This was actually a question that we had also for you, uh, the, the time that you can um, maximum uh, conclude uh, PPAs. If municipalities want to conclude an agreement for more than four years, it must present economic analysis. Okay, so this is already answer a bit our question. I guess the situation is different in any country. Um, did the city of Ghent put Bova in competition before signing the virtual PPA? Yeah, there was a public tender. Um, so, and there were several criteria. One was the size of the installation, the Distance from the city center uh, was another one. Um, price, uh, of course, uh, was an, an, an important one. Um, so I think these were the, the, the three most important. And of course, um, one of the criteria is also the uh, participation of citizens. Um, so, um, so these were, I think, the more uh, the four most important criteria. Um, and there was indeed a tender and we uh, were able to win it. I think uh, the criteria of uh, citizen participation is uh, one of the uh, ways municipalities are uh, in Belgium. Um, I'm see, I've am i seen this in Belgium a lot, that municipalities are using this criteria, of course, to favor local uh, ownership of the, um, of the uh, energy, the installation. So this is actually uh, happened also in Ganden. Um, okay, any yeah, other indeed. question? Uh, otherwise, I have another question for uh, the, who's, those of you who work for a municipality. Uh, what are the major thresholds for your municipality to set up PPAs? Uh, we can always, um, I'm going to share also these questions after the webinar in case anyone is uh, willing to to uh, provide the information and I'm 
now going also to explain you why, because I don't, as, as I see that I, that I don't have any other question in the chat, maybe I can a bit explain um, the context of uh, this webinar for Energy Cities. Um, we are working currently on a short briefing with the uh, RAP uh, on uh, power purchase agreement and how uh, they can uh, uh, be used uh, by municipalities. And so um, this webinar uh, is, uh, let's say, the first step um, of our work on PPAs. And by the end of the year, we will publish um, this briefing, um, this policy briefing. And uh, in 2024, we also uh, probably going to work more on solar public procurement as well. So in case you are interested in this topic, I really invite you to uh, register to the newsletter of our community energy hub. Uh, Jan, if you can share the link in the chat of the community energy uh, page of our website, that's where you can also uh, uh, register to the bulletin. And so I, I see that we are actually uh, we have finished our our time for today. Uh, I wanted to thank very much Monica and Frederic and also Maria Flora uh, for their time today. Uh, we will share, as I said before, the presentation by email later. And if you have any other uh, uh, question, you'll be able uh, to contact the speakers directly. Uh, thanks a lot.